<laughs> so we'll start with refuge in bodhicitta. Sangi <laughs> Dagi chun yan ki pe so nam ki Drola pen chi sangi dru pa shto Sangi chudam so ki chunam la Dan chu ba du dani kap su chi Dagi chun yan ki pe so nam ki Drola pen chi sangi dru pa shto and allowing that motivation to reconnect, adjusting it into language that resonates for you. Just be with that for a moment. Okay, so just the brief review, this was the very important point that is obvious and yet somehow questions still keep coming back to feeling like karma is one of these things. And so we just need to reinforce that karma is none of these things before we even start. And I'll just do it briefly this time, but it really does warrant repetition, repetition because I think that there's just so much in popular culture and so much in our conditioning that assumes that we already know what karma is and our, you know, maybe it's from previous religious conditioning, maybe it's from our parents, but it also could just be from songs on the radio. It could just be from kind of passing affiliations with different religious communities or spiritual communities that use this word incorrectly. So, Remember that karma is not fate, is not destiny, not predestination, not reward. That it's not punishment, it's not retribution, it's not related to caste, it's not unchangeable. Karma is not a judge or a jury determining guilt or administering justice. Karma is not God or personified at all, though it is personal. So we just really cross those out in your mind, okay, again and again. And anytime you feel yourself go veering off into those pop culture understandings of karma, you just kind of, nope, that's what pop culture says, or that's what new age religion says, or that's what previous associations have said to me, but this is not what karma is talking about. Remember that it's extremely hidden phenomena as opposed to manifest phenomena or hidden phenomena. That for, from a Buddhist perspective, our mind is able to access different levels of reality based on how developed our mind is. So all of us are able to access manifest phenomena. We can see that there is water in our glass. Our primary eye consciousness can observe it right in front of us. Hidden phenomena can be accessed through deep meditation with lots of practice. So the emptiness of inherent existence of a self that appears to a mental consciousness of an Arya Bodhisattva in single pointed meditative equipoise on emptiness is able to access this level of a, of a hidden phenomena. So for us, we have to learn about it intellectually first. And once we understand it intellectually first, we have really rock solid logic about it. We've kind of looked at all the crevices, we've looked at all the angles, then we repeat and repeat and repeat until it becomes experiential. So manifest and hidden phenomena are accessible to us. Extremely hidden phenomena, we can't really access until we're fully enlightened. So, 
therefore, we have to rely on our observation of the natural world and our reliance on the Buddha as being a valid being and therefore his teachings on karma are non-deceptive. So you go back and forth between karma, the law of karma, cause and effect. While we say it's a law from a Buddhist perspective, maybe we have to take as a working theory because we can't prove it experientially to ourselves immediately. We'll be able to down the track, but immediately what we do is ask ourselves, how does cause and effect play out in the natural world? And you see that from one type of seed comes a similar type of plant, or from one type of material comes uh, you know, the building blocks of something that contains it or reflects it. You know, a wooden table must be made of wood, a metal table must be made of metal, that things have a substantial cause that's of a similar type. You know, this is just kind of obvious biology. So we're taking that kind of understanding to our understanding of mind. We also think, is there a benefit in living in such a way that acknowledges the possibility of karma? And if we live in such a way that acknowledges the possibility of karma, we are ethical and we are kind. And those are also good reasons to live by this. There's not gonna be a disadvantage unless we start getting neurotic about it, right? But the other side of it is just to have some sort of faith based in experience about the Buddha. So not blind faith, not fundamentalist faith, not forced faith, but a, just a conviction that Shakyamuni Buddha who revealed this round of Dharma is not a liar because the things that I can directly prove things like if I practice patience, it gets easier. If I practice compassion, it gets deeper. And using his methods so far has worked. You know, you proved those things to yourself. You can make an educated guess and a really valid assumption that he's not lying to us about this deeper stuff that is going to take longer to prove. So you're just remembering karma is extremely hidden phenomena. That makes sense logically because how can you know the whole spectrum of cause and effect of even one tiny thing, the whole life story of one rock, you know, going back from its, its initial formation, you know, all of the tiny little chapters in the life of a rock <laughs> would be almost impossible to nail down, let alone all of the things that makes a person act and behave and think the way they do. So it's extremely hidden, not because of, I don't know, some moral issue of like, we're not allowed to know. It's extremely hidden because it's extremely complex. And then we went through these certainties of karma. That the first one is that karma is definite. The certainty of karma, which is that negative actions are the cause of suffering. Positive actions are the cause of happiness negative in the sense of destructive, positive in the sense of beneficial. Magnification of karma from one seed, many branches. And then the big one that is the most common misconception, which is that not experiencing the effects of actions you did not do. So if you're the one that created the cause, you're the one that experiences the result. That there isn't karma transference that we can have similar karma happening at a similar time. There is kind of group or communal karmic experiences that we can be a very powerful condition for someone's experience. They can be a very powerful condition for ours, but they are not the substantial cause of our experience. And we are not the substantial cause for theirs. We are a condition or they are a condition. And that actions you have done do not perish means that an action will have a result. Whether it's positive or negative, it will have a result unless, right? Unless dot, 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 it's purified or it's exhausted or it's burnt in some way. And that's where we got into our conversation of purification. And then creating karma, we need these branches to have a complete karmic action 
meaning one that's powerful enough to project a whole rebirth with all sorts of, you know, completing karma experiences as well, perhaps. So in the preparation, we have this motivation to do something, right? We want to, <laughs> we're planning on it, a wholesome or unwholesome intention to do something. Then we have a basis. There's a certain thing or a person that is the object of our intention and we identify it correctly. Then the action is done, meaning we ourselves do the thing or we get someone else to do it on our behalf. And then the action is completed. We've fulfilled the aim that we set out to do. We rejoice in having done the action. We feel satisfied by it. So with these pieces complete, you have a complete karma. So anytime you thought about something and then decided not to, or you started to and didn't finish, or you did it, but then regretted it, it's less powerful. Both, power, both in terms of positive karma and negative karma. So without these pieces complete, there's still a creation of a type of karma, but it's not a complete karma, it's not as strong. So if you do these complete karmas, then you've got these results, right? The ripening result, the body and mind will take in a future life, the causally concordant result, which is kind of the most interesting in terms of practice, so experientially, we experience a situation similar to the one our actions caused others to experience. And behavioral, we'll tend to do the action again in the future. And these two may synchronize or may not synchronize. So for example, you might experience a lot of criticism, but you yourself not give a lot of criticism anymore. What that means is that you once did, and you once did it a lot, you adjusted your behavior, but you're still riding the wave of having been quite critical in the past. So sometimes you are both experiencing and creating more of the same by doing more of the same, and sometimes not. So they don't always synchronize, but often they do, and it's worth looking at. The environmental result is our experience of the environment and climate where we live and the environment and climate where we live itself. So if you like where you live, if you enjoy where you live, um, that's one of the results of karma, but also what the layout is and the look of it. It's, it's interesting. Okay, so just to summarize, karma is related to what we're experiencing in the present is the result of the past. How we cope with the experience of the present determines our future, right? That's the summary. And new karma is created through the omnipresent mental factor of intention via the actions of our body, speech, and mind. Ripening of past karma is experienced mainly through the omnipresent mental factor of feeling. That's mainly where karma is experienced. And that's by experiences of pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, as well as other effects such as like behavioral patterns. So what makes karma heavy or light? Maybe we only briefly touched on this last time, but it's, it's worth looking at and it's what you would assume logically to be the case. So the nature of the deed, the intention and the deed itself, who it was done to, like what your relationship was, the strength of the habit, and whether a countermeasure has been applied. So that's just a quick summary of what we did before. Um, and it, it takes a while to process it, you know, it's lists and it's intellectual a little bit. Um, once you kind of get a handle on it, then you ask yourself, do I agree or disagree? What would it look like to live in accordance with these beliefs? And you just have to really make it your own by processing. You just need to sit with it. Um, but the main question that you guys were asking last time was how do you purify negative karma? And that's what the meditation we did at the end of last time was. That was a purification meditation. And the ingredients to purify are basically the four opponent powers. And that is to connect with your refuge, 
to connect with genuine re regret for your negative action, to apply a remedy or a countermeasure, and to develop resolve or a promise resolution to change the behavior in future, even if only for a few hours. And with those four pieces in place, you can do them formally in meditation. You can do them as a journaling exercise. You can do them walking around. The point is that they're genuine, that you're not just like jumping through the hoops and saying, I did my four opponent powers. Now it's fine that I did a horrible thing. La la la, off I go. You know, it has to be genuine. And a lot of the negative things you've done in your life have been minimized by the fact that you had regret. So even though you might not have known that the four opponent powers exist and are an important component to make sure your past negative karma doesn't bite you, still you probably did have some strong regret, which right away settles it. Just bringing those additional components of what's a countermeasure? You know, what's a, an opposite energy I can bring to that? The standard one is Vajrasattva practice, Vajrasattva's mantra. But if mantra recitation and visualization somehow doesn't connect for you, it's okay to think of something else, to be creative about it. You know, if you just bug bombed your whole house and then you realized, wow, that was just like genocide on the animal kingdom. Okay, that was not the right thing to do. What's well, a countermeasure? You know, you can go to the bait store and buy a bunch of worms that are destined to go to fishermen and then just put them in the garden. <laughs> You know, it's a countermeasure. You took life, now you're saving life. Yeah? And, or you could do a medicine Buddha puja for all of those insects that you harmed. You know, it, it, like be creative about it, but it's just something that stands in opposition to the mistake. If you've been horrible and critical and judgmental about someone at work, and you finally realize that despite their bad behavior, your criticism is still a fault, praise them. Yeah, genuinely from the heart, not in a false way, but find a reason to tell people the cool things that you know about them, you know? So it doesn't have to be in this kind of like religious structured, I have to sit down and be a good girl and do my prayers kind of way. It, it's very, very experiential. And the main part is genuine regret. And honestly, it's harder than it sounds because we're trained to have guilt instead. Yeah, our training is to say, if I feel bad about something, that makes up for having done it. <laughs> I can kind of keep doing it, actually, if I keep feeling bad about it. That's the, you know, the price I pay to continue to do the wrong thing. I feel bad about it. That's my payment, right? That's guilt. That's nonsense. That's horrible. How did we get trained this way? What? Right? Regret is just clean but it's honest and that's why it's so hard because you have to say that was the wrong thing to do that means i shouldn't do it <laughs> right there's no wiggle room like i'll keep doing it for a little bit because it's kind of okay and kind of bad or i'll keep feeling bad or i'll do some sort of self-harm to make myself feel better about it but that means i can still do it right yeah a lot of the time we're like I feel bad about doing fill in the blank, but not enough to change. <laughs> you know, I feel bad about being critical of my neighbors, but not enough to change. Guilt is terrible and it keeps us stagnant and it keeps us tired and it keeps us overly identified with our mistakes. Regret is just acknowledging that you have Buddha potential. You have the potential for absolute compassion, absolute wisdom that this mistake you made is out of alignment with your main goal. And you have the power to achieve that goal. And that's where your identity should be, is the Buddha you will become. And so it's like, oh, I fell off the track of achieving the goal I'll go on to do. So you just really wanna think of it as whoops and back to the path because you know everything bad you've ever done was a coming together of a million causes and conditions. You take responsibility, you don't attribute fault to yourself. You say the action was at fault, the action was faulty, but I am not bad, right? I am just a person 
with you know a series of experiences and a series of learnings that came from a million different places i have responsibility but i'm not bad and i'm not at fault do you feel the difference right similarly with good things right then you can't have pride or arrogance either right <laughs> because everything good about yourself was learned and trained in a million conditions coming together so you can think those actions and those skills are good and beneficial and i'm happy about them i like them but they're not mine they're not me they're just here so i'll use them yeah and then and then you can't have pride it doesn't it's like you there's no foothold for pride you just are happy it happens okay so that was the that was the quick summary of last time does that refresh any of the questions you had from last time that you want to ask mine was answered thank you oh good, <laughs> good. Hi, Tara. thank you <laughs> it has a question yeah go ahead in the chat that box, Pia has a question there. Is COVID a result of humanity creating killing karma as a collective? And in that case, can we do anything about such collective karma? Yeah. In any kind of sickness karma, any kind of sickness karma is going to be related to killing, probably. Yeah, killing or disrespect of life. Um, whether it's animal life or it's human life or it's just generally we have allowed humanity to think that taking life is okay for far too long. All of us have been a part of it, rather, whether it's directly or indirectly, you know, whether it's just our taxes paying for the military or it's our actual behavior of being a hunter or whatever it is. We, we, we all have a part to play in the fact that killing is so easy and natural. And at some point, we're gonna have to cop it. And it's, it's like, it's nobody's fault, but it's everybody's fault. Yeah. So, you know, it's just, you're not identifying with it, but you're thinking, I have a piece to play in the killing karma that's now ripening as sickness. What I need to do is to make sure I don't create more of this, first of all. It's like I have to like stop the flood, you know? And what can you do to stop the flood in your own life to have more reverence for life, more respect for life? And we can't, you know, all suddenly move to New Zealand, right? It would be nice if we could, Eleanor's there, but, you know, we can't just suddenly go to a country where they're much more peaceful, a lot less about the military, you know, it would be nice if we could be, but that's just not practical for all of us, is it? What we can do is to not be passive about, you know, the role our government has in the harm of the world. So you just, you know, for Americans, we have, you know, we need to vote. And for us, it's voluntary. So we really have to. Some countries you have to vote or you get a, a fine, right? But in America, you don't have to vote. And if you don't, you still have to wear the responsibility of your country because you're living there, right? So, so we all need to be engaged without anger in the politics of the country that we're in which means also in the politics of the state that we're in, the politics of the workplace we're in, the politics of the family we're in, and then our inner politics. You know, these circles of responsibility. You do your best and let go, and do your best and let go, and do your best and let go until you get to your own behavior, which you have the most control over, but still you don't have like 100% control over your own behavior either, do you? Because we're not mindful all the time. We're too distracted and that's, you know, we can train ourselves out of it, but it is what it is right now, you know. So you're just going through these layers of how can I minimize harm at all levels without getting sucked into the, I don't know, competitive identity game of politics. Be engaged without being attached because samsara is not fixable, right? We have to get out of samsara. We can't fix the symptoms of samsara, but we can make it a little better for each other and that's worth doing. So that's why you do your best, but you also let go. 
yeah, that push pull feeling. It's you have to find somewhere in the middle where you really are doing your best, but you're not all obsessed about fixing something that's fundamentally not fixable because human beings have ignorance and they'll keep making policies based on ignorance. Yeah. So in terms of purification or stopping it, I mean, like, for example, Lama Rinpoche, who has, uh, you know, a clearer mind than the rest of us, has recommended some practices to minimize the harm of the pandemic, to kind of take the edge off, to help slow it down in areas where people have the karma for there to be, you know, vaccines and easier access to medication and more hygiene and these sorts of things for that to happen more swiftly. You know, and it's so we do these practices for 24 hours every Saturday, <clears throat> and we've been doing that for months and months, and it's just on a roster. And um, people can join in or not join in, but um, there's a prayer a thon that we do every week. And um, it's like we can't fix it because it's already ripened, but we can soften the edges and, you know, kind of help it slow down or finish more quickly and these sorts of things. So we can help with conditions but the cause is already blossomed into a result. Yeah, so but hopefully we can prevent the next one by being more on top of our ethics. And, uh, you know, at least as an individual, how we're experiencing the pandemic is also quite unique, isn't it? There's the group karma of the whole world has this pandemic, but then there's our individual experience of it, which might not be more than a mild inconvenience. And so we don't want to let the fact that for us, it might be an inconvenience, but in India, it's devastating, block our empathy. Because it's not like they deserve it more than us. Don't fall into that trap. Yeah, we all have the karma for anything to happen. We've just had different conditions. You know, so never fall into that trap of they deserve it more than we do. Don't do that because anything could happen to us at any time. Yeah beginningless time who knows what we got up to we're just lucky enough to not have horrible devastating stuff happen to us in this particular lifetime but that doesn't mean we haven't created the cause for it <clears throat> yeah so proactive purification is a thing right so you take your life that you remember this life and you think in this life what have been the acts of killing you know, if you were in the military, that's obvious, but also, you know, what did you get up to as a young adult or a kid in terms of killing animals or killing insects or the things you got up to before you were a Buddhist or interested in Buddhism? You know, did you used to vacuum up all the spiders? Did you wipe over all the ants? You know, like what are your acts of just really not caring about the life of others? Maybe you put down your pets, thinking it was the right thing to do, probably with a lot of compassion. And so it's less heavy than if you just did it because you're sick of them, right? But still it, there's some killing karma there. And you just think about it without guilt, without identification, just killing was the wrong thing to do. I connect with my refuge. I need to apply a remedy. What can I genuinely do moving forward that is going to preserve life and not take life and for how long? And for some things you can say, this life never again will I intentionally kill. But it might be too soon for you to say that with honesty. So you say, today I will not kill ants in the kitchen, just today. And then the next day, just today. And then the next day, just today. And then you stop doing a habit. But you have to be honest, right? Because if you say never again to something that you really don't have that, that solid grounding in, you set yourself up for failure, then you have a whole guilt trip spiral and you might even get worse than you were before. So, you know, make a, make a plan that is smaller <laughs> than what you think you can actually do because every time you achieve it, you build momentum to fundamentally change the behavior. Yeah. And when you do that, then you think, any time I've done any act of killing from beginningless lifetimes, may I purify that as well. So you take what you remember as the example to get you some genuine regret, and then you add to it and anything else I can't remember from beginningless lives of this type. So then you purify it all together. Does that make sense? 
Yeah. And then, of course, once we realize emptiness directly, our purification is like a blowtorch over all those karmic seeds, and we just tons and tons get purified every time we meditate. But up until that point, we still can get good work done. Yeah. Yeah. Other other questions? Yeah, Venkabal, well, if I can just quickly ask. Oh, I'm sorry, Sarah. Just sorry. Please go ahead, Sarah. I was going to ask something about purification, but. Um, Sarah, do you want to go ahead, please? Yeah. Oh, unmute, please. Ah, uh, let me. Uh, yeah, you need to unmute. Ah, perfect. Um, perfect. thinking a bad thought, but then followed by regret. Is that action a karma action or not? You know, sometimes we have suspicious mind, but then immediately afterwards, um, a regret comes up. So um, mm. is that a karmic um, action? <laughs> It's not a complete action. It's not, no, it's not a complete action. It is an action, you know, it is, a, it is, what, we'll get into some specifics of that stuff in the next section, but, but just briefly, no, it's not complete karma because you have regret. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the danger is in that, in that is that you have a, a negative thought and then you suppress it mm -hmm. and you don't want to suppress it. You want to know what you're saying to yourself. You know, and so letting it form words for a moment, but then with some space with it as if it was someone else saying it and go, mm -hmm. oh, wow, I really think that my neighbors mow the lawn at 11 just to annoy me. I really think that I think they're doing it just to annoy me. And I'm really mad at them about that for being so inconsiderate and rude. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Okay. I can feel some anger in response to that thought. Let's just kind of sit with that and look at the disadvantages of anger. Mm -hmm. Anger settles. Now let's look at the actual situation, true or untrue. Because what can happen is that if you have a negative thought, there can be a correct observation. You know, something that is truly observable. That is something that happened. It's just your conclusion is wrong. Your conclusion is therefore they're bad or therefore they're horrible or therefore I should be angry. Your conclusion is the thing you don't want to have. But the observation might be accurate and you still might need to do some action or not. Mm -hmm. So if you squash it, that, that becomes some kind of repressive thing which can make you a bit angsty, a bit melancholy or just like amorphous grumpiness and irritability or even bubble into some real problem. So, so have your thought, but then have some space from your thought and go, okay, some pieces there that are mine, some pieces that are theirs. Anger is not what I want the response to be, but that is an issue I need to come back to when I settle down. And you just kind of put a pin in it. I'll come back to that when I settle down. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. But yeah, don't, we will think all sorts of nonsense. Yeah. Don't worry about every, every single thought you have. We think all sorts of crazy stuff and you just... Let it roll through. <laughs> yeah. yeah, let's see. There is a question in the chat, which is, um, are all the people who benefit from structural racism, but are unaware of creating it, negative karma, there's no intention, but still systemic oppression? Yeah, that's a really good question. There's, there's a lot to unpack there, isn't there? Um, I think that all of the time, because we have ignorance about how we exist in relation to others, all of the time there is a little bit of oppression and taking advantage of others, isn't there? Whatever color we are, we're always sort of, you know, standing on the neck of someone, whether it's an animal or a person or it's a systemic thing. And so all of the time we, we need to be kind of looking at, I am not fundamentally separate from others. My mental continuum is not, 
unaffected by others, even though we have distinct separate mental continuums, we're so fundamentally interwoven with each other that our impact is almost indistinguishable. So the fact that people are oppressed, of course, is their negative karma ripening. Doesn't mean they deserve it, doesn't mean it should happen. The fact that we might have, you know, some sort of advantage because of what we were born into, whether it's economic advantage or racial advantage or gender advantage or sexuality advantage or whatever advantages we have, that is the ripening of positive karma. But then if we use that to further oppression, we create negative karma. So it's, it's like a fine line. It's like, you, you, this is good karma ripening that you have benefits, that you have advantages. But if you're using them to perpetuate systems that oppress others, you're creating negative karma. But how much is very much about how intentional it is. So the thing is, is, you know, I, I often think about my friends in Israel because it's such an obvious example of the oppressed becoming the oppressor and not clean, not tidy. You know, it's not like it's so simple as that. And there's a lot of nuances. And I don't want to, you know, get out of my lane, but, you know, I've, I've lived with them long enough to, to see that there is some pervasive cultural attitudes that are quite ironic to observe as an outsider. Because you're like, so, you know, the Holocaust, <laughs> that was bad. <laughs> that was the worst thing. That was just unbelievably bad. So, you know how that was bad, right? You're all with me? So then what's happening in Gaza right now? I'm just saying, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's ironic and it shows us these behavioral impacts of karma that you have the karma to experience something, but you also have the karma to continue to create it. And the, the way those don't always align is tricky because once you're no longer the victim, but you still have the tendency to be the perpetrator. So that's what we all want to be working on because we know like in, for example, instances of sexual abuse where there are some people who are victims of sexual abuse who would never hurt anyone ever. And they take the harm that was done to them to have just huge empathy and compassion and their life becomes about protecting others and you know helping others heal. And then other people who are victimized then become perpetrators themselves, right? There's two responses to the same trauma. And why is that? It's really interesting, isn't it? Like, why are there two responses to the same trauma? One is compassion, one is to continue to do it. And it's really based on who is the person that it happened to in terms of their spiritual development. Did they have the mental space? Did they have the support? to take it as a training to open the heart? Or did they not have enough support and a not enough you know, mental spaciousness and other things to help them take it on the path correctly this time? So these are conversations that you, know, you have internally with yourself and you really explore deeply. They're not conversations to have with people who have been traumatized, right? Unless they are also Buddhist and bring it up first. Okay, so that's just the disclaimer. Please don't talk about karma with people who have trauma unless they want to. Yeah, and unless they have a therapist and they're doing pretty good, okay. But what you do for yourself is you ask yourself, of the bad things that are happening to me, have I taken them as fuel for compassion or have I become resentful about them and I want to continue them? Yeah, because people are, you know, we take judgmentalness and criticalness as our example, okay, because we all experience that at some point. Do I take the fact that people are judgmental and critical to me as fuel for my compassion to make sure I don't continue to do that because I know how much it hurts and the harm that it gives? Do I take that information and I use it for my path? Or do I say, well, I cop it all the time. You should learn how to cop it. I'm going to give it right back. Right? And I'm guessing we alternate, right? <laughs> some days we're kind and take it on the path. And some days we lash out and are just as critical as the behavior we hate when it happens to us. 
So with all of the karma conversation, you have to make it personal and ask yourself, what is my response to harm and pain and suffering? And am I using and acknowledging it in such a way that I don't create more of the same? And even more than that, am I using it in a transformative way to open my heart even further because I understand more about human suffering and the universal kind of suffering of humanity and what we do to each other? So karma is not an invitation to look for who is right and who is wrong because we are all right and we are all wrong. We just take turns being right, wrong, right, wrong, right, wrong. You know, we just take turns. And that's why the cycles of violence in countries continue because, you know, it's like, well, I'm, I'm the victim, you're the bad guy. Now I'm the bad guy, you're the victim. And now you're the victim. Blah, blah, blah. And it just keeps going. And it's like, well, it'll stop if someone takes responsibility. But how can you take responsibility when it's so tangled? You have to just say, today I can take responsibility to not continue this cycle. Just today, <laughs> you know, because the whole spectrum of the past and what we've all done to each other, extremely hidden phenomena. It's been really bad and it's been really good a million times. So how is today? Yeah. Venerable, do we have a time for another question? This, we have sure. a question from Heather in the chat box. How should we think of the difference between a positive or negative karma, ripening and deserving that, res deserving that result? It, it's like you have to somehow take identity out of the picture. It, it really feel like it's a garden and you've planted a bunch of things in your garden. And then when they start to sprout, you go, oh, they're sprouting because they had the right conditions to sprout, you know? And the ones that aren't sprouting obviously didn't have the conditions to sprout. So I didn't water them with the things that make them blossom, you know? So they're there, they're hanging out, they're latent. Maybe you think, oh, actually those seeds I planted last decade, I really don't want to water because that's going to be horrible. I'm finally realizing those were terrible seeds. So I have to go in and burn them. Yeah, with purification. Some of the seeds that you planted in the past were amazing, wonderful seeds of compassion and kindness. You want them to blossom. You want to have happiness in your life because happiness, it's much easier to be kind when you're happy, right? You know, it's a good, it's a good kind of foundation to be very kind. And so you want your happiness. And so you water the right seeds. And you know that they're your seeds, you planted them, but it's it's different than like deserving because someone gave you the tools to plant them. You know, not just one someone, but a million someones from beginningless time. But you know that you were the one that planted them. You know, you were that last step that went pop into the soil, you know, or pop into the mental continuum. You were that final step, even though a million things came together before it. So you, you've inherited a lot from your previous lives and your previous relationships and your previous influences. You know, we, we're inheriting our present moment. So the question is, what is the legacy we want to leave our future self? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there, there really have been some awful things that have happened in my life. And I think remembering karma has made me feel a lot more empowered about how I respond to them because they don't feel random now. The scary part was the randomness. The other scary part was the feeling that something I did in this life meant that I deserved it. When I couldn't find anything that I did in this life to deserve such a horrible thing. You know, you're just like, why did this happen? I was just minding my own business and bam, this happened or this happened. You know, I was a nice person or I was a kid or whatever, right? Like there was nothing you did to deserve it and you didn't deserve it. But at some previous life, you were the jerk, you know? You just certainly weren't as a little kid and you certainly shouldn't have had terrible things happen to you. But you know, 10 lifetimes ago, who knows what you got up to? Maybe you were part of the wild west and killed a bunch of Native Americans, you know? Like that's gonna come home if you don't purify it, you know, whatever, right? So yeah, it's a, it's a funny thing to feel like, 
by taking responsibility, you have less identification. It feels kind of like a paradox, but that, that's kind of the place that we're living in. Yeah. Yeah, Bonnie? Hello. Hey. Um, I actually don't really know how to word my question, but you're talking about suffering and I am suffering at the moment because um, my husband is leaving me Aww. and I can't and I and I'm hearing everything you're saying and it's really resonating yeah. in me and you know whatever I've and I'm like you said a minute ago what have I done to deserve this what have, and I'm stuck I am stuck I'm meditating and I'm trying to smooth out everything and try and make some reasoning in it and I'm and I'm not in a good place and I'm yeah. just stuck I'm stuck 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 and I need to get out of it I need to get out of this because I'm not doing me um my my kids and whatever I'm not doing anybody any good and I'm I'm but I'm just going round and I'm not yeah. I'm all clouded up and you're trying to make it make sense yes I'm trying to make make sense and I don't know how to I'm sitting with myself and like you say re, trying to work out okay and I've if I've done something I accept it and I've whatever I've done I've I'll, I'll make you know I'll try I'll, I'll make, I'm trying to be as best a person as I possibly can I'm not saying I'm a perfect or an angel but I'm trying very hard and have done for years so something's happened yeah. somewhere because but yeah. I, just, I need something and I, I, I just don't know how to get out of it and it's and it's pretty miserable and uh and that's I'm, horrible yeah 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 and, I, and you know how can i purify <laughs> well and, uh, I, mean, I, I think, think you have to make sure your... how can yeah. i purify today so i make feel better tomorrow <laughs> yeah yeah and i mean it ain't happening. You, have start, you have to start by thinking you can't fix it right okay. right and maybe you can fix it but you have to start with i can't fix it <laughs> Right, yeah, you have to somehow let go of the story of what you thought your life was going to be. Yeah, because sometimes the karma of relationships just finishes. It just finished, and it might be nobody's fault. It might be somebody's fault. It might be met lots of faults. There might have been blah 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 blah, but sometimes karma just finishes, and this is the thing about karma is that everything has a different potency so like you think like i cut my mother's irises in the garden the other day and they just keep blooming and blooming and blooming and i just have to keep taking off their little heads and a new one comes and they're just lasting forever but a few weeks ago i bought a rose for my mother for um mother's day and it died in like three days you know, and I was like, but it's the same vase and it's the same water and it's the same, you know, but they just have different potencies, right? Yeah. One has the potency to last three days, one has the potency to last three weeks. And I did the same thing to both of them. You know, I changed their water regularly. I put the little sprinkly thing that you're supposed to do. I snip their ends, you know, all the things. Mm -hmm. And they just have different potencies, right? And so the same is true of relationships. And I think this happens to us all a lot where sometimes it just finishes and we're trying to force it back together, but it lost potency. And yeah. so you're thinking, okay, I do these tricky things in a relationship, you know, I'm terrible in the morning or I communicate in an inelegant way about this and I do this and this, but I did that the whole marriage. Why is it a problem now? <laughs> You know, I'm not new, right? They seem to be fine with it 10 years ago. Why now? You know, or I did this and this, but we worked through it. And you're trying to make it make sense because you haven't changed that much and they seemed okay with you then. But the thing is, is that it's not about those things necessarily. I mean, it could be a buildup of resentment over time and they've just had enough and to hell with you. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's just, it lost power to be together. 
and it's it's done. And that is the hardest thing because we really do want to land on something controllable, some reason that's definable, and you might not find that. And to release spaciousness for something new to happen that's good, you have to somehow make peace with what's happening right now. And it might be that if you let him go and give him space, he'll come back around and it'll all be lovely or not, <laughs> right? You can't yeah. predict it, but you know that for you to have creativity in your life and love in your life, there needs to be spaciousness to allow it. Yeah, because yeah. you're being flooded by love, I'm sure, by your kids, by your friends, but that doesn't mean you feel it yeah. because your mind's all agitated with trying to fix it and trying to understand it. Fix, understand, fix, understand. And you're just in this like, you know? Yep, exactly. You said, so, so, so to start with just, just ran out of gas. Yeah. Just ran out of gas. And what is the cause for a relationship to break down? It's, it's some, something in, the, in some previous life, some act of division in some life somewhere. It doesn't have to be about this one. You know? So you divided two people with your words or with your actions, maybe a, maybe a romantic relationship, maybe a friendship, maybe something else, but there was something divisive in your past. The question is, you know, have you moved on from that habit pattern? And you can just be like, okay, that was a past version of myself. And now I'm just kind of reaping it. And if I finish it and exhaust this karma with patience, that seed's done. It's done. But another question is to ask, am I still a little bit divisive in some of my relationships? You know, are there two friends who are whining about each other and I'll kind of let it continue by feeding the fire and saying, yeah, they do do that. And what's more, they do this. And remember 10 years ago when they did that? Yeah, remember? And you know, you kind of keep the drama going. That's divisive. And if it's not purified, karma expands, right? So it can expand into all different kinds of divisions and relationships, unless it's purified. So, I mean, we've all done that a million times. You know, so we just kind of got to nip it in the bud. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So my, my heart's going out to you because it's, we, I think we've all been there in some way or another and it's yeah. like the most devastating. It is the most yeah. devastating. And I can't yeah. imagine when you've been together a long time and you got kids. So please take care of yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So the other question was, um, can we purify karma for our past lives? And yeah, definitely we can. It's just, it's a matter of really thinking genuinely about a harm that you've experienced or seen and taking that to the cushion or taking that to the four opponent powers. Yeah. One of my teachers even says it's useful to do this while watching the news. Like if you're seeing some terrible thing happen in some other country to think, I've created the cause for that. And I'm just lucky enough that those seeds haven't been watered. I, you know, I regret any action where I have participated in genocide or I've participated in this or I've participated in that. And you genuinely think if there is any part of me that has been a part of actions like that, that is not my path. And then you think of some countermeasure, you know, and then you think I'm not gonna do that. It's, it's a really different mentality in Buddhism, isn't it? Because we kind of are passively good people. Yeah, we're passively good people who don't mean any harm. We're polite, but we're not proactively non-harming. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And it adds power to your practice and it adds power to your mental continuum and your life and your impact to consciously be non-harming as opposed to passively non-harming. And it means when situations where harm could happen arise, your default is not to harm back. Yeah, your knee-jerk reaction is, I'm not retaliating. You know, you don't have to stop and think, don't hurt them. You just naturally don't want to hurt them. But that's a conditioned response that you build through the ordinary days. And that's why we do things in Buddhism, like take vows, why even, you know, lay people will take vows, like not to kill, not to steal, etc. 
you probably didn't kill and steal before. You weren't like, you know, a big embezzler. You weren't taking all the stationery from work. You're a grown up. You've grown out of that or whatever. But to say proactively, I will not cause harm in this way, creates such an energy and a momentum of non-harmfulness every second of every day. So the power of a promise really can't be underestimated. It's an interesting psychology, but it's also very powerful karma. Yeah. Yeah, any, any other questions before we do a couple new bits? I can just ask Venerable. You know, when you were yeah. saying we can purify even walking, you know, we're walking yeah. and we're purifying. Or let's say driving, you're in the car and you're thinking, you know, um, yeah. just if you can take us through very briefly, if I can clarify, because we've got the four steps, you know, yeah. refuge, regret. And we say those things normally, you know, in the process, you know, you take refuge and then you regret and you generate regret and you say it, you utter those words yeah. you know, of regret. So if you don't and you just pass it in your heart, you feel it that psychologically you feel you generate that kind of energy. It's enough to for purification to take place as effectively. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Maybe yeah. even more effectively. Yeah. Some people, when they do their prayers, it's like autopilot. You know, they're just like ticking off things on their list of the to do list, and they're not actually feeling it. If you're, you have to deeply connect for it to work. Yeah. So if you're driving and you're thinking, do you know what? I have refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, mainly the Dharma, mainly the Dharma that I've integrated in my own heart. I really do, you know, and you just, with things like compassion, are this place of safety for myself and for others. They really are. And you just like, in your own words, in words that make sense to you, touch it. And then you think, and today at work, when I cut this person off during the meeting and I overpowered them and I was being dominant and I was being really aggressive with them, that is not my path. That is not how I want to be. And that was a mistake. It caused harm. That was harsh speech or whatever it was. You know, you recognize the fault to be a fault. And you think, okay, so what's my remedy? And my remedy might be saying my Vajrasattva mantra as well. I'm driving in traffic, you know? your remedy might be okay tomorrow I'm going to reach out to them and I'm going to apologize and I'm going to remedy it in that way just practical human ways that's not always practical though you know sometimes the relationship's too complicated to do that right but say it's not go ahead and do it yeah but you're just thinking of a, a real strong countermeasure you're being creative and then you stop the stoplight you have a little think and then you think what's my resolution that's practical can I say I will never do that again? No, I can't. I can say I won't do it tomorrow. Yeah, and I won't do it tomorrow. And tomorrow there's going to be another meeting and there's going to be another opportunity for that same old pattern to kick in. And consciously tomorrow, I will not. You know, and you just, you repeat it to yourself. You reinforce it to yourself so you don't forget it. Done. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it helps if the next morning you remember your resolve, right? So in the morning, you're setting your motivation. May I be of benefit to all sentient beings, including myself. May I be of benefit to all sentient beings. And remember the staff meeting. <laughs> Don't yell at so-and-so <laughs> or whatever, right? You change patterns that way, right? Yeah. Thank you, Venerable. Yeah, there, there's nothing magic about being on a cushion with your altar, you know, unless you're the one who's made it magic. It's not magic from its own side, right? You're the one giving power to these objects. They do have power from their side because of the, the beings that created them, but they are only going to impact your mind deeply if you allow that. They'll impact your mind in some way because these are enlightened beings who created them. But to really fundamentally shift something, it's completely your relationship. So, you know, it could be a big old elaborate gompa setup, or it could be the tiny wee Buddha you've blue tacked to your dashboard. You know, like don't make it too precious. You know what I mean? Make it so much a part of your life that it's just your go to. How do I bring Dharma to this moment? How do I bring Dharma to that moment? quietly internally no one even knows 
Okay, so we'll just do a couple more pieces and then we'll do a little sit. So we did, um, I think we briefly looked at these environmental results there. And I think that Miriam did them with you in some way as well. So it's, it's good to look back over at the environmental results because it can kind of make you curious about if you're still creating the cause for these. <clears throat> and these are related to the 10 non-virtues. Um, so there's, let's see. I think I'll skip that slide. Let's just look at this concept of actions as opposed to paths of action. So <clears throat> let's see, if you look here, there's there are things that are karma and then there are things that are karmic paths. And so the seven non-virtues actions of body and speech are not only actions, but they are also paths of action because body and speech are the bases of the intended operation. The three mental non-virtues, covetousness and so on, are paths of action, but not actions. So, you know, it's kind of an interesting Venn diagram, but what you're looking at here particularly is the things that are both. So the non-virtuous actions of body and speech are both actions and paths of action. What does all this mean? This means really look at particularly when you're with people, what are you doing physically and verbally? Yeah, of course, when you're by yourself, look at your mind, be aware of your mind, really think about what's happening there, have that mindfulness that is observing your own mental processes whenever you can, meaning just being awake to yourself right? Not just autopilot, disassociated, just going through the motions of life, but you're a little bit awake to yourself while you're living your life. But then when you're with people, very, be very conscious about what is coming out of your mouth. So you're shifting emphasis, because if you're aware of what's coming out of your mouth, you are aware of your mental processes as well. Yeah, because it has to kind of go through a series of thoughts before it comes out of your mouth. But if you're not thinking about what comes out of your mouth, you just say it with no space. And sometimes it works out and sometimes it doesn't. But in your daily life with humans, <laughs> really be watching, what are you saying? And then also physically, what are you doing? Yeah, mainly what are you doing in terms of killing, stealing, sexual misconduct? avoiding those, obviously, but just also, you know, how are you in your space in terms of creating a safe space with people? Like, are you invading their space? Are you having a dominating physical affect? Like, are you touching people's shoulders when they don't want to be touched? Are you coming too close to people and it's actually uncomfortable for them? So just kind of being aware of your own physicality this is the invitation of this teaching, is to really be very clear what is happening verbally and what is happening physically. And so then this kind of goes back to the earlier question of when do you like accumulate karma or when is it like a karma? When is it just a thought that passes through and when is it something that's a little bit more significant, I guess? And in the levels of yoga deeds, it says, Karma whose result you will definitely experience is that consciously done and accumulated. Karma whose result you are not certain to experience is consciously done but not accumulated. So in both there's a consciously done aspect. So of course it goes without saying that if it's not consciously done, it's not such a big deal. So the same text, this levels of yogic deeds sets forth the distinction between having done karma and having accumulated karma. So here's uh, done but not accumulated. And this is all from the Lam Rim Chenmo, by the way, if you wanna go back and look at any of it. So it says the following 10 types of actions, actions done in dreams, those done unknowingly, those done unconsciously, those done without intensity or not continuously, those done in error, those done forgetfully, those done without wanting to, those naturally ethically neutral, those eradicated through regret, 
and those re eradicated through a remedy. So they're done, but they're not accumulated. So you're not gonna necessarily experience a result from those. So that can be good news or bad news. Um, it's good news for your, you know, negative karma that you've genuinely regretted and eradicated through a remedy, but also the ones that you've done in dreams and things like this. It's bad news if you've been kind of casually kind, nice, and, you know, but not really put a lot of effort into it, I guess. Or, um, yeah, just kind of passive politeness. So again, just bringing more active, conscious, intentional beneficial actions so it'll be stronger so it'll have a stronger effect so here's just uh in using the example of killing to kind of show you the possibilities between this done and accumulated so we looked at you've done but not accumulated these ones like in dreams etc going over to you have accumulated but not done so you've like, a, for example, killing, you've obsessed and planned for a long time in order to kill a living being, but then you don't follow through. So it's not great to have that mental habituation that's seeking to kill, but if you wind up not doing it, you haven't accumulated that karma. Done and accumulated is all of the killing not done in the first and second case. Basically you intended to, and you did it. <laughs> And then you neither done or accumulated is basically you didn't intend to and you didn't do it. So that's pretty obvious. The main thing here is how intentional was it? Yeah, how intentional was it? Um, and I, I feel like it's, it's useful to look at this box over here that says you have done but not accumulated. One of the examples is if you're forced to against your will, yeah, or you did it only once and then immediately regretted it. These two, I think, are the ones that people get hung up on in their life as their big mistakes, their horrible wrongs. They feel so much identity about them, when in fact, these actually aren't accumulated karmas. If you were forced to do it, or you did it, whatever it was, just once, but you immediately regretted it and you never did it again, we can hang on to those things our whole life, but actually you regretted it, let it go. So we can prevent or minimize negative karma from ripening as suffering through purification, right? Through Vajrasattva with the four opponent powers or through the wisdom realizing emptiness or both. And this second one is gonna take some time to unpack um, and this is an important philosophical point in Buddhism, but for now, just focus on Vajrasattva, or at least the four opponent powers, because that's the main ingredients. Okay, so there are those once again, and we'll do that meditation now once again. Um, do you need a stretch before the meditation? Yeah, like two, two minute break? Yeah, okay, two minute break and then we'll do meditation. Thank you, Venerable. See you in two minutes, everybody.
Okay, coming back. <clears throat> Sorry, the glare of the window's a little much. I'll scoot it over. There we go. Okay, so getting yourself a very settled posture. <clears throat> Straight back, chin gently tucked in. And take a few intentional breaths all the way in and all the way out. Okay, so now start with connecting with refuge. And whether it's a specific identifiable Buddhist refuge, or it's more in terms of ideals and concepts that you value, you just think about connecting with a healthy knowledge and observation of what the afflictions can create. So what your negative states of mind, what, what your destructive actions of body and speech, that they can create harm. And so you have a healthy fear that you really don't want to keep doing this. And then you connect with the ideals of compassion and you think that they're embodied and represented by radiant white light above the crown of your head. And if it feels comfortable, you can put the image of Vajrasattva there in the center of the white light. But connect with a faith based in conviction and logic that things like compassion and wisdom and patience protect the mind protect you from harming yourself and others. So just create that visualization above the crown of your head and bring an association of refuge to it. And you think I do this practice of purification, not just for myself, not just to avoid suffering in the future, but in order to stop causing harm to others and also to move through these mistakes to my fullest potential, enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. and then generate the power of regret. 
So now is not the time to go into your deepest and your worst. Just think about a couple of negative actions of body, of speech, and of mind. Maybe even just one of each. Things that you've done recently or habitually that you know are not your path. And just seeing faults to be faults with a sincere acknowledgement that those behaviors, while dependently arisen and empty, are still conventionally wrong and to be prevented. So under the compassionate gaze of Vajrasattva, ask yourself, physically, have there been any actions of killing, stealing, or sexual misconduct, like maybe adultery, things that have harmed others with my body recently or habitually that I need to purify. And then thinking verbally, are there actions of lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, senseless speech or gossip? Things that I know not to be my path, but I still do, but need to purify and interrupt the momentum of just thinking verbally. And then thinking about the mind, are there actions of ill will and anger, covetousness and attachment, wrong views like mistakes of ethics, any patterns of your train of thought that you can identify as mistaken and needing to be purified? And then apply a remedy. So you can either make a plan 
about a countermeasure, one of healing and transformation, or you can experiment right now with doing this mantra of Vajrasattva. We'll just do the short one a few times, but imagine that from Vajrasattva above the crown of your head comes streams of radiant white light flowing down and through you. bringing purification and healing. And then adding the mantra to the visualization. Om Vajrasattva Hum, 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 Om Vajrasattva Hum. Om Vajrasattva Hum, 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 Om Vajrasattva Hum. And feel purified and released of those mistakes. Letting go of identification and think in the future, what can I do differently? Physically, verbally, and mentally. Something achievable and short term. And making a promise to myself under the gaze of Buddha Vajrasattva, what will I do differently? And you can add to the practice the thought that the agent, yourself, the one who did the negative action, is empty of inherent existence because you dependently arise. Your karmic actions, what has been done, the results are all empty of inherent existence because they dependently arise. And the object, who or what the action was done towards lacks inherent existence because they dependently arise. and think that Vajrasattva dissolves into light and absorbs into you, blessing your body, speech, and mind.
and dedicate. Jantu Samchorim Poshe, Marke Panam Ke Guachi, Ke Fan Yam Pame Pahi, Gon He Kondu Pawasho, Tony Dawarim Poshe, Marke Panam Ke Guachi, Ke Fan Yam Pame Pahi, Gon He Kondu Pawasho. May we realize bodhicitta, may we realize emptiness. And by bringing method and wisdom together, may we achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings. And you can relax your attention. Okay. Thanks everyone. And uh, enjoy the process. Thank you for everything. Please, please come back and teach us again. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much for everything, really. <laughs> yeah. All right, have a good rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye, Mark. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you so much, Venerable. Thank you so much. This was wonderful. Thank you, Miriam. Mm -hmm. Wherever you went. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>